All right. Oh, whoops. Second. Second. Last minute change. Welcome everybody. Welcome to your on book show. Uh, no uh, music today. I'm on the road and it's difficult. No, it's not a new condo. It's a hotel. Um, life is not quite back yet, but uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to trying to be normal. So uh, this is a hotel in uh, California. I'm here for the weekend uh, until Monday. And uh, I was in Colorado yesterday, so I'm flying. Planes are packed, packed. No middle seat, empty, nothing. I mean, there's not a seat to be not a seat to be had on uh, on the various uh, on the various uh, airplanes. So so pretty amazing. I hope the sound is good. Let me know if the sound is good. Hope the picture stays good. Uh, I usually try to get a wired internet connection at the hotel because I don't trust Wi-Fi. But these people. This hotel, they lied to me. They told me there would be a wide internet, and there isn't. So, uh, so I'm I'm doing this by Wi-Fi. So just let me know if um, if the picture stays stable and stays good, uh, and that everything everything uh, everything goes well. Also, let me know what the sound quality is like. Uh, hopefully, it's good. Uh, television here is uh, it's big. It's not huge. Maybe sixty five. Yeah, I think 65 inches. Uh, it's, you're looking at it at kind of a weird angle that makes it look bigger than it really is. What else do I want to tell you? Uh, that's it. So we're, we're in a hotel. I'm in a hotel. I'm going to try to do a show tomorrow also from this hotel. We'll see if I can pull that off. It depends on when, when they want me to check out. Um, and I'm, I'm driving down to San Diego tomorrow, and I'll spend one night in San Diego, and then one night in Dallas, and then finally get home. It's not easy particularly with the limited flights these days. So while the flights are full, there are very few flights. So uh, it's very difficult to get in and out of Puerto Rico given, uh, given, the, uh, given the limited number of flights that exist today and all the restrictions that exist. So we made it. Uh, it's not easy wearing a mask on a plane and, uh, and keeping that going, but... Uh, I survived it one more time. All right, let's see. Um, uh, Chris says, thanks for recommending the documentary Poverty Inc., powerful film showcasing great African advocates for business. Absolutely. Yeah, excellent film. Poverty Inc. It's a, non, it's a um, documentary. I think it's on uh, Netflix. Chris will correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's on Netflix. All right, you guys know the drill. Don't forget to like the show before you leave. Don't forget to share my programming more broadly because that's how we'll gain new uh, viewers. And don't forget to support the show. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's really crucial to, to the continuation and the prospering of the show to support it financially. Amazon Prime, Chris says. It was on Amazon on Prime. So uh, you can check it out there. Um, and of course, we've got a Super Chat feature here. And uh, please feel free to use it. And if there are any of our whales out there Free, free to um, to uh, use this as a mechanism to uh, significantly support and promote the show. All right, I've got my coffee, and uh, we're gonna get going. So uh, a few a few uh, shows ago, I talked a little bit about like sugar subsidies and um, and how all the distortive effects, the kind of sugar sugar restrictions on uh, on uh, importation tariffs. Uh, uh, subsidies and then that effect on corn and why corn farmers supported it. And people found that quite fascinating and people didn't know much about it. So I, I figure we'll, every, every once in a while, we'll spend some time looking at, if you will, the impact of the mixed economy on, um, you know, on, on our standard of living, our quality of life, on, on the economy, on how we are doing, how, how uh, each one of us is doing from a material perspective. So um, we're going to be doing that, uh, showing you kind of the perversions of a mixed economy, showing the consequence of a mixed economy, uh, showing how 
cronyism becomes an inevitable feature of the mixed economy. You just can't avoid it, as I showed you with the sugar and Ted Cruz and, and, uh, and uh, uh, corn farmers and ethanol and that whole story. So today, I want to focus on a different industry. Today, we're going to focus on the shipping industry, shipping industry. I did a show, uh, a, a, a very positive show about the shipping industry a while back about containers and how containers changed the world, shipping containers. Uh, and uh, I really like that story. That's one of my favorite stories um, because it's very positive and it shows kind of the, the ability of entrepreneurs to really change the world. And But today we're going to talk about uh, how the United States regulates shipping, how it controls shipping, and kind of the distortions and perversions that that creates. And also that, you know, b because of that, kind of the cronyism that that establishes and how all of that works through the system. Um, I came across this story on a, uh, a a blog, I guess you could call it a blog, that I really want to recommend. I want to recommend the work of this economist. Uh, and of course, his name is not on the article. Um, uh, let me find his name. That's not right. I need to give you the name. So his name is Scott Lynn Sicom. Something like that, L-I-N-C-I-C-O-M-E, Scott Linsicum. He is a, uh, I think he was a lawyer. Uh, he's now uh, mainly writes about economics. A lot of it's the intersection between economics and politics, economics, and uh, and law. I'm learning a lot from his stuff. It's really good. It's detailed. It's, you know, consistently free market, at least the stuff I've seen so far. I think he works for Cato, but he publishes on the Dispatch. The Dispatch um, is a Substack. Those of you who know what Substacks are, it's a Substack. Uh, I love Substacks. It's like blogs that you get in the email. Um, Scott's stuff is excellent. Uh, his Substack is called Capitalism. It's a capitalism with an O. C A P I T O L I S M. Capitalism. Uh, it's the intersection of politics and capitalism and, and economics. That At least that's, I think, why he chose that name. Uh, and the stuff is excellent. I recommend it. Uh, follow him, uh, support him, and uh, consume the material because it's good stuff. Anyway, he had a piece uh, called Your Summer Cruise Just Got Cabotaged. Cabotaged. We'll get to what cabotage means. So um, we're going to, I'm basically going to be summarizing this article that he wrote, which which I think is excellent about this whole issue of shipping in the United States. And it came to his attention uh, because there was a story out that the Canadian government has now extended its pandemic related moratorium on foreign ports arrivals. So if you arrive in Canada from a foreign port, it's a real hassle, right? So so they don't allow uh, ships to dock in a Canadian port if they're coming from a foreign port. This is part of the COVID stuff that's going on. Anyway, um, this is imperiled, made impossible, U.S. cruises uh, to the coast of Canada, which is, of course, beautiful. But curiously, it has imperiled U.S. cruises to Alaska. It turns out, it turns out, I don't know if you guys knew this, that if you leave Seattle on a cruise ship, bound for Alaska. Alaska cruises are amazing, beautiful. I've never been, but the pictures and the photos and the videos I've seen are just stunning, right? So so uh, uh, traveling to right, Ala Alaska is, I mean, Alaska is beautiful, but it turns out that to get to Alaska from Seattle, from Los Angeles, from San Francisco, or even from Hawaii, the cruise ship has to dock in a Canadian port before it reaches Alaska. So they can't go straight from Seattle to Anchorage. That's illegal, literally illegal for a cruise ship to go directly from Seattle to Anchorage. They have to stop in a Canadian port in between. They're not allowed to go directly from Hawaii to Anchorage or Anchorage to Hawaii. They have to stop in between in a Canadian port. Now, why is this? 
Why is this? Well, we'll get to that. So, of course, everybody's pissed off. Everybody's upset. The Canadians, they, they, the Alaskans are upset. So they're putting pressure on the Canadians. And they're putting pressure on the Canadians to change Canadian law so that they can come to Canada. You would think, if they were rational, there's a wish list for you, if they were rational, they would put pressure on Washington, D.C. to change American law so that American ships wouldn't have to stop in Canada because they do. So why do they have to do that? It turns out, another example, if you want to ship, if you want to ship um, LNG, you know what LNG is? It's liquefied natural gas. So if you want to ship liquefied natural gas, uh, which, which we produce, like we have a lot of natural gas, and to ship it, it's easier to turn it into liquid, and on the other side, you turn it back into a gas. To ship liquefied natural gas from, um, from Louisiana or Houston, like natural gas producing places with refineries where they can liquidify the natural gas, to Massachusetts today in the United States is illegal. It's illegal. It's a very efficient way of transportation gas, transporting natural gas. It's, um, but you can't ship it between two U.S. ports. Can't ship it between two U.S. ports. Why? You can't take a cruise from Alaska to the mainland U.S. without stopping in Canada. And you can't literally transport American produced liquefied natural gas from Louisiana to Massachusetts. That seems insane, insane. Do you know where Massachusetts gets its natural gas from? They can't get it from Louisiana, not by boat, and I don't think there's a pipeline, or maybe the pipeline doesn't supply enough of the gas. Do you know where they get the natural gas from? Russia. So it's legal for Massachusetts to get gas from liquefied natural gas from Russia, but not from Texas or Louisiana. Not even, by the way, from a LNG terminal that exists in Cove Point, Maryland. It would be really cheap because it's a short trip. So these are the kind of mysteries kind of perversions, the kind of distortions, the kind of insanity that we are going to talk about today. Now, today is going to be a little challenging because I'm on a laptop, so I've got this tiny little screen, and I'm trying to get all the Super Chat questions, and I don't have enough screen space to have everything that I want on the page, and I'm scrolling around, and I'm a little lost, so you're just going to have to be patient with me today. As, as we walk through this. All right, so let's try to explain this. Basically, these are called cabotage laws. Cabotage refers to transportation. It refers to uh, primarily uh, by shipping, but also uh, it, cabotage laws apply to airlines. And we'll talk about airlines later because very similar distortions occur in airlines. Uh, and, uh, and, and generally, the transportations of good from point good or people from point A to point B are covered under cabotage laws. And since the beginning of the United States, uh, this shipping in primarily has been regulated by Congress. As far back as 1798, 1789, Congress placed prohibitive tariffs on use of foreign ships in domestic trade in order to support the local shipyards and the fledging U.S. Navy. So the idea was in order to support the ability of the United States to build its own ships, in order to support American sailors, in order to support the American fleet, all kinds of regulations were passed to make it very difficult to impossible for foreign-built ships 
a fallen man shipped, a fallen own shipped, a fallen flag shipped to actually operate in American waters. Unless they were coming from a foreign country. Now, there are two, at least two um, laws, acts that apply today to these issues. The first one you might have heard of is called the Jones Act, right? The Jones Act. The Jones Act is the Merchant Marines Act of 1920. It's a 1920 bill. It was, uh, it was basically uh, passed in order to ensure we had a domestic shipbuilding capability and that we had merchant marines. So in times of war, you know, they could transport troops and transport equipment overseas so that we could go to war in Europe or wherever, Middle East. South America, wherever we need to go to war. So what the Jones Act actually says is this. If you want to transport goods between two places in America, between two ports in America, because this relates to shipping, you can only do so, only do so, on a U.S.-built, U.S.-owned, U.S. flagged and U.S. staffed, U.S. owned, U.S. built, U.S. flagged, and U.S. staffed boat, ship. In that sense, the United States has one of the most restrictive shipping systems in the world. The only two countries that restrict shipping more than the United States are, drumroll, Indonesia, which is just a series of hundreds of islands, right? And they have very restrictive shipping system. And two, China. And who is closest to us, but we are more restrictive than them? Russia. So the United States has restrictive shipping laws like Russia, China, and Indonesia. That's who we compare ourselves to when it comes to shipping. The land of the free, the home of the brave, the birthplace or the, 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 the greatest manifestation of capitalism in human history is now at the level of Indonesia, or has been for a long time in terms of shipping. So note what this means. An American can buy a ship, let's say in Greece, man it with Americans, put on a US flag, and it is would be still illegal for them to transport goods from Massachusetts, from, from Louisiana to Massachusetts. This ship literally has to be built here, owned by, owned by Americans, flagged in America, and staffed by Americans. Now, how many merchant marines are there in the U.S., the people who work on ships in the U.S.? Not many. If you've ever been on boats, ships, cruisers, not a lot of Americans. And indeed, the United States, there is not a single ship that is U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, and U.S. staffed, that can transport liquidified natural gas. Which means, since there's no U.S. owned, U.S. built, U.S. blah, 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 there's not a single American ship that can do that, which means there's no way, no way to transport Louisiana gas to Massachusetts. You can, Massachusetts can buy it, consumers in Massachusetts can buy it from Russia, because there's no restriction on Russia, Russian boats coming in to Massachusetts as long as they're not coming from Louisiana. Right? So imagine in a real free market world, right? Russian ships, let's say the Russians are really good at ships. I don't know if they are, but let's say they were really good at ships and they had great crews and they had great ships for natural gas. Well, a Russian ship could go to Louisiana pick up net, net liquefied natural gas and take it to Massachusetts and sell it over there. But that's illegal. Why is, why is almost everything more expensive in Puerto Rico? Because in order to transport anything by boat from mainland United States to Puerto Rico or to Hawaii or to Alaska, if you're going to do it by boat, Hawaii and Puerto Rico, it's the only real viable way to do it. You could use airplanes, but that's even more expensive. The only way to do it 
is using a U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, and U.S. staffed ship. And again, liquefied natural gas, they just aren't those ships. And we'll talk later about what ships they are, how many of them, what's their quality, what's their cost. Now that's for goods, right? What about cruisers? Because the Canada thing was all about cruisers, right? What happens to cruise lines? Well, this is an 1886 law that basically applies the same restrictive rules. It has to be owned, flagged, built, and staffed by Americans in order to cruise between two U.S. ports. So if a Carnival Cruises leaves Seattle, but Carnival Cruises is not staffed by Americans, I don't know if it's flagged in America. It's probably not flagged in America either. It cannot travel between two U.S. ports. It has to, therefore, stop at an international port in between before it gets to the second U.S. port. Right. Now, you have similar laws for salvage, towing, dredging, all this stuff. Just unbelievable. Now, what does this do? It dramatically increases the cost of U.S. shipping because transportation between U.S. ports, there's no competition, right? Prices go up because there's no competition. Hard to tell how much this is costing the U.S. economy, but uh, OECD studies found that output, just by getting rid of the Jones Act, output in the United States would go by 50 to $135 billion dollars. And that's way underestimating the true cost, as we'll get to all the different complications that happen because of this. Imagine, so even in the waterways, you know there's a waterway that goes all along the East Coast? The only boats that are allowed to function in that waterway, American-built, American-owned, American-flagged, American-staffed. Imagine if there was competition there. Imagine if the cost of freight between U.S. states, between U.S. ports, between U.S. cities was reduced dramatically. Well, you'd have more trade. You'd have, therefore, more output by other industries. For inside the United States, consumption. Today, you would have to ship those goods either by boat at very high tariffs or by truck or by railroad. Now, I often wonder, why in the United States of America do we have so many trucks on the road? Why do we have so... I mean, there's a ton of trucks on the road, and it makes it dangerous. Uh, many, many of the accidents we have with mortalities are caused by trucks. Uh, trucks are a huge burden on the infrastructure and, tra uh, and the transportation infrastructure of the United States. Why do we have so many trucks on the road? Well, a major reason we have so many trucks on the road is because we can't ship by boat. Or we could, but it's way too expensive because of the Jones Act. It, it also has to do with the fact that we've regulated the railroads, so the railroads are nowhere near as competitive. Uh, imagine a world in which railroads had never been regulated, or hadn't been regulated in the, starting in the 19th century. We would have, I believe, the most effective, fastest, most robust rail system in, in, in the world. Imagine if government hadn't spent gazillions of dollars building the interstate, interstate system, interstate highway system, and instead we would have had private railroads. The whole way of life would be different. And we'd have phenomenal rail service. Why is the world, the rest of the world, way ahead of the United States on rail service? Partially because we destroyed our rail industry. We were way ahead of everybody at the turn of the century. We destroyed it through regulation. So John, Jones Act just puts more burden on truckers, more supply for them. Now, note that that means that trucks and railroads have a strong incentive never to get rid of the Jones Act because it supplies them with a huge amount of demand which would go to shipping if the Jones Act ever went away. 
Now, in addition, we have a very small shipbuilding industry in the United States. Unbelievably inefficient. Unbelievably inefficient. Because it faces zero competition. Because shipbuilders in the United States are the only ones who can build ships for U.S. owned, U.S. manned, U.S. staffed, U.S. flagged ships. So they don't compete with foreigners. They've never developed a competitive niche. Niche? Niche. Niche. Right? And to build a ship in the United States is four to five times more expensive than it is to build abroad, even though labor costs in the United States in, for shipbuilders are not very high by international comparisons. Now, in spite of the fact that it takes four to five times more, or maybe because of this, shipyards are heavily, domestic shipyards are heavily subsidized by the federal government, by the state government, by the local government. They subsidize it enormously. Now, it's true. Foreign governments like the Chinese and the Koreans also subsidize their ship bills. But at least they have, they face competition. And U.S. ships cost 400% more than foreign ships. But if you want to transport goods between two U.S. ports, you have to pay the price. You have no choice. And of course, it's just not worth it to buy a ship from a U.S. shipbuilder to transport LNG between, for transport between. The margins are just not high enough. They're not willing to pay. Massachusetts would rather just buy their natural gas from Russia. So we've got a shipyard business uh, industry in the United States. But it's completely uncompetitive. Even the servicing, the servicing of U.S. owned, U.S. built, U.S. staffed, U.S. flagged ships is done overseas. Even though when they go overseas, they have to pay a 50% tariff. It's still cheaper than servicing the boats in the U.S. That's how inefficient our industry has become. So it truly is, truly is unbelievable. And yet nothing happens. Nothing happens. Um, ah. So we get higher shipping prices, right, which depresses the demand for shipping, which leads U.S. companies, shipping companies, to buy fewer American-made vessels because there's this demand, which raises the prices, which reduces demand, which causes them to buy even fewer and fewer and fewer. And so today, there's only, what, 93? There's only 93 U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. manned, U.S. owned ships in the United States. And they have to supply Puerto Rico. They have to supply Hawaii. They have to supply Alaska. They have to supply the inner, all the inner canals in the United States. Any transportation between two ports in the U.S. uses those ships and no others. So, of course, prices are going to be through the roof. Sorry, 98 ships. Now, of the 98 ships, one third are 20 years old and another quarter are 30 years old, more than 30 years old. So we're talking about an old, inefficient, unproductive shipping industry. Unbelievably expensive, unbelievably inefficient. Now, you get the same thing with the cruise lines. Indeed, when it comes to cruise lines, there is, there basically are no large American-made cruise, cruise ships. They just don't exist. There was one attempt, one attempt. There's one large cruise ship that is considered made in America. We'll see. Made in America. It, 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 it works out of Hawaii. It's called, according to Scott, he says, funnily enough, he deliriously named Pride of America. Pride of America. So here's the story of Pride of America. You can find this. There's a New York Times article about this. You can find it in other places. But just look up Pride of America. So in 2001, 
and I'm reading for the article, Powerful Southern Center tried, and it failed. A bungled half ball was declared unfloatable and was towed across the Atlantic to be completed in Germany for Norwegian cruise lines. But to avoid embarrassment to the United States government, the ship is still billed as made in America and therefore can travel between two American ports. It's the only cruise ship in the world that can travel between two American ports without stopping in some international uh, destination in between. Now, I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand the extent to which, the extent to which the mixed economy is everywhere. And the extent to which most of us don't know it. Most of it is invisible. But it's everywhere, distorting, perverting. Brad, thank you. That's very generous. Roland, thank you. Um, Really appreciate it. Those are the super chat contributions. The mixed economy is pervasive. Government involvement in our economy today is pervasive. The distortions are unbelievable. This is just one industry, and we're talking about tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. One little industry. Just extrapolate that across the mixed economy. Extrapolate what it would entail if we could actually get rid of all these distortions and perversions. It's truly hard to imagine the amount of wealth that would exist in this world just if we actually deregulated. Really deregulated. Not the Trump minor, but really got rid of, deregul- got rid of regulations. We, we, we need a bill to get rid of the Jones Act, a bill to get rid of this other act that affects cruise ships. Now, the other part of this is the excuses. What we need, we need these the shipbuilders. We need very inefficient, very, very expensive shipbuilders. We need these boats so that if we ever get engaged in a war, we can use them to ship stuff to wherever it is in the world that we are fighting. Now, why we need to be fighting elsewhere in the world, why we need to ship a lot of stuff there, why we can't just crush the enemy and come home, that's a whole other story. But during the Gulf War, the United States military shipped a lot of equipment, a lot of tanks, a lot of stuff to the Middle East. It only used 29 American ships, 160 foreign ships to do it. Yeah, we got help from our allies. We even, it turns out, got help from the Soviets. This is 1991, I guess, from, from Russia. We got help from Russia to ship our military equipment because our ships are so bad our ships cannot handle the u.s military so why pretend why pretend (sighs) now notice the unintended consequences i hate the unintended consequences because many of these uh, should have been predicted and therefore, in a sense, are intended. But one of, the, in, one of the problems is too much trucking. Too many pipelines need to be built. Where shipping might be much cheaper than pipelines. I don't know. Nobody's run the cost because nobody cares because shipping is out of the question. It's impossible to ship natural gas. So you have to build pipes because of laws, because of regulations, because of the Jones Act. What kind of cost do these impose? What about the lives? What about the congestion? What about the damage to the infrastructure that so much trucks, so much trucking involves? Right? What about the fact that we rely, that vast parts of the United States rely on foreigners, on, on foreign natural gas, when cheaper natural gas is available right here in the United States? What about the, the, the poverty that results in places like Puerto Rico because everything is so expensive? because of the Jones Act. And if American producers can pass on the cost and still use American shipping, then we as consumers are paying higher prices. So everywhere you look, there are distortions, perversions, 
and lost revenue. Uh, there's a Scott list, a, a good example here of uh, San Diego has um, cruise docks that are basically vacant 90% of the year. 90% of the time, they're vacant. 80 miles south in Mexico, there is a cruise port that is busy all the time. All the time. With basically American ships. They're just not ships that are owned, built, da da da, because, right, the only ship that's built in America is Pride of America. So it's a dock that basically exists in order to serve the law that requires you, before you enter the United States, to stop in a farm port. Without this law, those cruise ships would start in America and end in America and transport people between America. creating jobs, creating economic activity. Who knows? Of course, one of the biggest lobbyists to keep these laws in place, particularly with cruise lines, are the Canadian government that loves the business in Canadian ports and the Mexican government that loves the business in Mexican ports. So notice how you get these lobbying coalitions. Right? You get these coalitions You've got truck drivers, you've got the Canadian government, you've got the Mexican government, then you've got shipbuilders, you've got unions that are associated with the people who build the ships, and then you've got a bureaucracy, a massive bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., that is built around enforcing these laws. And all of these have strong incentives to keep the Jones Act and to keep the, the Cruise Lines Act in place. Who has an incentive to abolish them? Well, all of us. But all of us don't get organized. All of us don't have a lobbying arm. All of us, you know, yes, everything costs me a little bit more, but I'm not willing to spend big bucks to get rid of the Jones Act. But you know what? The Canadians are, well, I don't know if the Canadians are, but certainly the unions and the shipbuilders and all these other incentives, the truckers, they have huge incentives to spend a lot of money to keep these laws in place. So you've got well-organized, highly motivated, highly financed, lobbying organizations domestically, public relations machines. They've got their own institutes called the Transportation Institute. They've got lawyers, lobbying organizations. And then there's the rest of us and we're not organized and we don't have a pressure group and it's too complicated for us to get a pressure group together. Who's going who's gonna to fight the Jones Act? Nobody. So who's going to win? Well, the people with the money, the people who are going to knock on the thing, the people who can organize voters, the people who are going to, unless, unless you have a moral objection, unless you're fighting for free markets, unless this is just one blimp in getting rid of the mixed economy. But you see, it's impossible to do this piecemeal because you're going up against unbelievably powerful pressure groups. Now, for example, in the Trump administration, in the energy department, which was one of the better departments where they, they did some better things and deregulation, they tried to get, this is in the government, they tried to get a 10-year Jones Act waiver, not do away with the Jones Act, just a 10-year Jones Act waiver just for LNG, just for liquidified natural gas. And they had the entire U.S. oil and gas industry behind them lobbying for this. And this is huge. It has geopolitical implications. You're not relying on the, on the, on the, on the Russians. It, you know, it's just, it just makes complete sense to be able to transport gas between the United States and the United States. And yet, despite the fact that people within the Trump administration supported this, pushed for this, tried to get this through, it didn't happen, partially because Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao opposed it. She was, by the way, named American Maritime Partnerships inaugural Maritime Hero. She was made a hero. A new award invented for this purpose. Basically because she opposed a 10-year moratorium on the Jones Act only for LNG.
Now, that's how powerful the deep state is. That's how powerful the lobbying is. And the only way to fight them is to truly fight them. Not by piecemeal, not by little 10 year programs, not by a little bit here, a little bit there. But by a complete repudiation of all of this. And of course, that's what was missing. That has been missing from the Republican Party forever. Certainly the Democrats are not going to do it. What you need is a complete repudiation of the involvement in government in shipping, in steel, in aluminum, in manufacturing. And yet the lesson learned from all this is not that's a direction we should move. The lesson learned from this is not we should move more strongly towards getting the government out of these industries. The lesson learned is we need more industrial policy. We need more government involvement. I mean, the, 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 the lesson learned is kind of the national conservatives who want more and more and more. By the way, can you guys, is, is this, are we still on? I can't tell if we're still on. Are we on a different channel or something? Did we switch? All right. I guess we are still on. I went away again. Oops. What is this? Huh. Okay. We got a different, different chat stream. Let me close this chat stream. We come and go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, this is why I hate, I hate doing shows on Wi-Fi. Hate doing shows on Wi-Fi. And not on. Uh, okay, let me shut that down. So instead of learning the lesson from this, what we get is we get a Republican Party that wants national conservatism. It wants industrial policy. It wants the government to show up more industries in the United States. The government to protect more quote American jobs. All this does is destroy American jobs. It creates industries that aren't competitive. It raises costs for everybody else. And it's an overall unmitigated disaster. So hopefully you learned something, a little bit about the Jones Act, about cruise lines, about why industrial and how industrial policy just does not work. It doesn't seem to really matter. It doesn't seem to really matter. Nobody seems to really learn the lesson. Nobody really seems to learn from it. Um, the right lessons. And it, it's more evidence that what we really need to do is, um, is fight on principle. Not put our hopes on any one of these... Uh, political parties and politicians and, and political groups. And indeed, you know, we, what we need to do is fight, fight the Republican national conservatives, fight national economic policy, national industrial policy, all these policies that only distort, pervert, create bad incentives and cost us, cost us jobs, cost us money, cost us wealth, cost us lives. But that's direction we are all heading unfortunately all right let's uh look at the super chat yes i got all the super chat questions i think um i didn't mark them all for um all right let's have a look um so somebody's uh, uh i think it's alan gives this example and i think this is example directly related to the jones act this is about offshore wind. You know how they're building off the coast, I guess, of, 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 um, of Massachusetts and some other places. They're building uh, wind farms to produce energy off the coast. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, 
uh, and he's giving the example of one developer is getting bids from U.S. fab yards and around one billion for an offshore wind installation vessel. Again, because and they can only buy it from a U.S. shipbuilder, one billion dollars. It's five times the cost in China, three times the cost in Europe. Why can't they buy the ship in China or in Europe? They have to buy in the U.S. and pay three times or five times the cost. Now, if I was a supporter of wind, I think this was absurd and ridiculous, right? I'm not a big supporter of wind, so if it's a little bit more expensive in the United States, they're still going to build it. So it's still going to, so it's just going to come out of my pocket because it'll be subsidized. But just consider that. Five times more expensive. And they're forced to do it because somebody deems it in our interest in some way. Uh, Dara writes, I've heard the same arguments for protecting food, corn, sugar, automobiles, Obama, Obama bailing out GM for national security in cases we need huge internal supply of food G and GM to make total uh, tanks for total war. It's completely nonsense. Complete nonsense. Of course, Trump did the same thing. I mean, it's easy to blame Obama, but Trump subsidized corn and sugar. Trump put tariffs on steel to protect the American steel industry because we need steel for war. But the amount of steel we need for war is very small. The entire U.S. production of steel, even without the tariffs, would suffice if we shifted it to war production, according to generals whose stuff I've read. I've read. But don't forget, we have allies. Not everybody in the world is our enemy. Brazil, Canada, most European countries, they produce steel. I'm sure they would sell us steel for manufacturing of weapons if we got into trouble, if we got into a war. Um, corn and sugar, we need corn and sugar for war? How is sugar a national security threat? Sugar is to protect the corn farmers so they can continue selling corn syrup. And it's to protect the sugar farmers so they can continue to give money to Marco Rubio. There is no national security to produce corn or syrup. There's no national security reason to build automobiles in the United States. You know what? There's certain factories in the United States that build tanks. We build, I, I don't know what the name of the latest tanks used to build, M60s. Why not build capacity to double the capacity of tanks and mothball it? And when the need arises, open those plants up. Make sure they're fully automated. They're as robotic as possible. Let's even assume we need more steel production capacity. Mothball some plants. And at a time of war, open those up and use those to produce. Don't believe. This is the thing, though, that drives me crazy about people. Not you guys, but people. Is that if a Democrat says it's a national security issue, then all my friends go, oh, they're just bogus. That's ridiculous. That's just an excuse. But if a Republican says it, never mind a Republican, if Trump says it, like with steel or with farming, everybody go, oh, no, this is good. We have to subsidize the farmers because the Chinese, and we have to subsidize steel because of the Chinese, and we have to subsidize. Why? Because Trump said it? No, the arguments of, to intervene in the economy for national security reasons are all bogus, all of them. There is no role for the U.S. government in the economy. If there are national security concerns, then deal with them narrowly as national security concerns. If you need extra capacity just in case of war, create that extra capacity and mothball it. Don't put that online to compete. Don't subsidize. Maybe Boeing thought, maybe if there was a possibility for Boeing to go, get, uh, to, 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 to go bankrupt, what would happen if Boeing went bankrupt? Would the United States not be able to build fighter planes because Boeing builds a number of fighter planes? No, the fighter plane business at Boeing is very profitable. Worst case scenario is uh, you couldn't build domestic airplanes, uh, airplanes for, for uh, you know, civilian transportation. So what? Why do they have to be American planes? And the, if Boeing ever went bankrupt, then they could spin off the military stuff and shut down the civilian stuff, if that, if that was ever necessary. 
But no, we're never going to allow them to go bankrupt. Under the guise of national security, Boeing is too big to fail. And Boeing will be bailed out by government no matter what. You can guarantee it. Now, take another example. Also, uh, cabotage laws. Why is it that there are so many airlines in the world, but none of them fly between American cities? Like, why can't I get a British Airways flight from L.A. to New York? Why can't I get a, a, a um, I don't know, a Korean air flight from Miami to Houston? Why can't foreign companies compete in the American domestic market? Because there's a law that says they can't. Why can't British Airways buy American airlines? Well, because American airlines, not that particular airline, but all American airlines, cannot be owned by foreigners. They have to be owned at least 51% by American entities. So, for example, when Virgin wanted to fly in America, they had to create a separate company, owned 51% by American investors. It was owned 49% by the original Virgin. And it flew in the United States. But it could not have, it, it, it could not be part of the Virgin Atlantic Airline, it had to be run as a completely separate, independent company. Why? Because those are the requirements of the law. Th there's just no exceptions. It's just, that's what you have to do. Right? So, in the United States, transportation to a large extent, I mean, imagine what flying in the United States would be like if U.S. airlines not just had to compete with the other three U.S. airlines, there are like four or five of them. But imagine if they had to compete with Asian airlines, Singapore Air, the best airline in the world, supposedly, or, or the Emirates, or Air Italia, or Air France. Imagine if globally... There was actual competition. If American Airlines could fly within European cities, I'm sure in Europe it's the same thing, within European cities and, uh, uh, you know, uh, between Asian cities. And I imagine if you really had free transportation, freedom in transportation, not free transportation. I mean, it would be unbelievable. It would be cheaper and better, dramatically better. I mean, flying in a U.S. airline is no fun. But that's because it's a small group that they compete among each other by the same standards. These are the kind of laws, again, a mixed economy. All, by the way, the airline laws are all also justified in terms of national security. Because we know that if British airlines, if, if, if the Brits owned American airlines, I mean, that would be a disaster for national security. I mean, Jesus, really? How could you even consider such a thing? Yeah, you'd have some big global airlines. It would be, international travel would be unbelievably efficient. But there wouldn't just be one airline. There'd be competition. Plenty of market space. Plenty of drive. There'd be fewer airlines than there are today in the world. But who needs so many airlines? One of the, one of the, uh, one of the indications that the market doesn't need so many airlines is the fact that they form these alliances where they try to create a pseudo looking something that looks like looks like just three or four airlines so that they're, they're, they're these three alliances but it's not one airline it's nowhere near as efficient as one airline thank you ashley i really appreciate that um she ashley asks you make a study of current events tolerable and worthwhile I also value a line of questioning. Why are things the way they are? Yeah, I mean, we have to really think why people buy into this. Because we're not going to solve it otherwise. We're not going to get past this idea that things are the way they are. By the way, Ashley, good luck on your new venture. It seems really exciting. Um, 
Ashley's doing a, like a psychology, is it a podcast or is it a uh, blog? I can't remember. Maybe it's, I think it's a blog, but it looks interesting. about art, psychology, objectivism. I hope it's okay to be uh, giving you a little bit of free advertising. Um, let's see what I, I, yeah so always be suspicious when people raise national security issues always particularly if it's around sugar or corn but even shipping or anything else um also note that when these laws get established what they create what the law creates is a pressure group. The law makes a, crush, a pressure group um, an integral part of it, right? Because it, it, it benefits certain people. The pressure group, the pressure group, now has a massive incentive to keep the law in place. And the problem politically is that the people who want the world law to go away are diffused. They're not concentrated. They're not focused. They're not. They don't have the money, the resources, the time to get rid of the law. So the people who want to keep it are far more motivated than the people who want to get rid of it. And that's why the people who want to get rid of these laws, us, we have to want to get rid of all of them. We can't fight them one by one. There's no way to win that battle. And this is why what we need is a president who will do away with regulations through legislation, find ways to get legislation that eliminates regulation after regulation after regulation after regulation in big chunks, in big chunks. And unfortunately, we, we haven't had a president like that since Ronald Reagan. And, and even he didn't do that much. It was basically two presidents who did that, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. That's it. That's it. All right, let's see other questions. Um, in the national security argument, is the national security argument only valid in a mixed economy? By this, I mean, in a truly free society, would the national security only be funded voluntarily by its citizens via persuasion? Yes. So national security would be funded voluntarily by its citizens through persuasion. You would voluntarily send a check in for the purpose of national security. But there would be national security planning and considerations in a free society. So the government would have to consider if we have to go to war, where would we get our steel? And they might want to take some of that money and invest it in some building some steel plants and mothballing them so they don't compete in a free market in just in case in war so you in a free market in a proper government the government would take into account and have a plan on how to deal with it but the plan would be contingent on no interference in the private economy during peacetime now during war you you might have to compete because you might have to ramp up production of certain goods which would compete with the private sector. But during peacetime, there's no interference. Yeah, I did get the questions from the other stream. Let me go back backwards and find them. There they are. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm looking for questions that relate to this, and then I'll uh, and then I'll take other ones. Uh, let's see. All right, none of them are uh, none of them are related. So let me. Oh, here's one. What is your top methods of transportation to travel on for both long and short distances? Oh, well, it's not really related, but I fly, um, and I drive. I like driving. Uh, I like the experience of driving. So I like doing road trips. I like uh, I, I, I like driving fast. But I, I like doing road trips. Uh, I, 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 I find driving very relaxing, therapeutic. Um, so uh, driving and flying. I, I rarely take ships, boats, you know, uh, and I've done, I think, one cruise in my life, two maybe. Um, and I haven't, I don't really, I'm not a huge fan of trains, not a huge fan of trains. All right, this is a $50 question, so it, it gets priority, and then we'll go backwards. A follow-on from the GME shows, when I sell or buy stock, who am I buying them from or selling them to? How does the price know, how does the price know 
whether the transfer of ownership of stock was triggered by someone wanting to sell or buy and move accordingly. So when you buy a stock, you're buying it from a market maker. And the market maker sometimes will provide you a stock that they have in inventory, right, in inventory, so that, uh, and they keep an inventory because people are buying the stock all the time and they don't have to go look for stock in order to supply it for you. Or um, if they don't have an inventory, they will go and buy it and then sell it to you. So they, there has to be a spread. It's called the bid-ask spread. So when you come in to buy, you're buying at a particular price. That particular price was typically set by the market maker. That's, again, this bid-ask spread. So uh, you're going to buy at the higher price and you sell at the lower price because they have to make the spread. So they're going to sell you the stock at the high price and buy from you the stock at the low price. And what they make their profit is the spread. That's what Citadel shares with Robinhood. They share part of that spread. Robinhood sends the trade their way, out, way in that spread. Part of that is goes goes to Robinhood. So how does, a, how does information get embedded in prices? Well, think about it this way. Let's say the bid-ask spread is, let's say the stock is, um, is selling between 50 and 50.5. So if you sold the stock, it would be 50. If you bought the stock, it would be 50.5. And let's say you, you, you at, at, at 50.5, you're buying. So you, you come in and you buy a bunch of stock at 50.5. And the market maker is saying, okay, people are willing to buy at 50.5. wonder what happens if I push it up to 50.75. And you continue to buy at 50.75 because you think it's worth 55, let's say, right? So the market maker says, okay, there's, there's demand at 50.75. What if I raise to 51, 51.25, 52? And only when you stop buying, somebody stops buying, it doesn't have to be you, but people stop buying. Does the market say, oh, oh nobody's buying at 52. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, let me lower it to 51.75. Let's see if anybody buys there. And a lot of people are buying at 51, but well, maybe sentiment has changed. I'll go try 52 again. And that's how prices are moving, and the same on the sell side. And even the bid ask spread might expand or shrink depending on supply and demand for buying and selling the stock. So that's kind of that's the mechanism. Now, if if you want to, if, if if we need to get into more details of it, then I'm happy to do that, um, uh, Brad. Uh, but that's that's the basic idea, okay? And. Uh, you're almost never buying it from somebody who's literally selling it. Uh, I mean, you're never, because it goes to a broker, the broker goes to the market maker, the market maker makes the transaction, then it goes to a clearinghouse where they literally make sure that you've paid your money and the stock has arrived and it all gets transacted. So it's, it's, a, it's many, many parties touch this transaction in between, and that's what people don't understand. They have no conception of what's involved. And of course, the money is often buying, selling stock, often on margin. You're often borrowing money to do it. You're borrowing it from the broker. If the broker, if, if, if the market maker or the clearinghouse is suspicious that the broker doesn't have the money or the broker's not good for it, then they might hold up a transaction. And that's what happened to Robinhood, right? That's where they had to reach, $2.4 billion. It's a lot of money. Okay. Um, let's look, that's good. Okay. So I'm, uh, just going to go from the top down in terms of the questions. W uh, what's an example of objective and non-objective thinking? I was watching a debate with a rabbi and thought about this when he brought up that he's never met an objective person. So objective thinking is, ob of thinking is thinking, right? In a sense, it's, it's redundant. It means that you're referring to facts. You're referring to reality. You're being logical and rational. Non-objective thinking is not really thinking. Non-objective thinking is really when you're using emotions, you're letting emotions interfere, you're letting emotions uh, move you in one direction or another, you're letting that impact your decision-making, or you're evading certain facts, you're purposely not looking in certain directions, you're only using facts that are appropriate, or that, that uh, fit what you think the conclusion should be objective means taking in all into account all the facts 
uh, applying to reality, using logic, not letting emotions intervene, and not letting your biases intervene. Objective thinking is hard because it's very hard to let go of your biases. It's very hard to look at reality and actually examine the facts and make sure you have all the available evidence and are not overlooking anything. That requires real effort. So I can understand him saying he's never met an objective, somebody who's really objective, because it's unusual to find people who are who are really who really make an effort in their thinking to be objective, to be fact based, to be reality based. All right, we've got some twenty buck questions here. Let's do, see, um, and I might have skipped some twenty buck questions as well, but. I own a manufacturing company. For the first time in 30 years, most of my suppliers are warning me of shortages. Is this a side effect of inflated cu the currency or COVID or both? I think it's probably, uh, it's certainly COVID. Um, I think that, you know, it's hard to tell what, I don't know what manufacturing company you are, but uh, certain businesses, uh, the, their supply chain has been significantly hurt and damaged by COVID. Uh, people are not going to work, people are not allowed to work, people are not allowed to travel, certain businesses can't produce. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not clear. Mining operations are, are for raw materials are there. There's a shortage in, um, in chips right now, in uh, semiconductors, uh, partially because of COVID. So I think, I think it's mainly COVID affecting it. I, I'm trying to think of inflating currency would do this. Um, Nobody wants the whole dollar, so nobody's willing to sell, maybe, because because they're worried the dollar will collapse. Maybe, but but I'm not I'm not convinced of that. I think it's more related to COVID. And and all of the economic disruptions that have happened of in terms of COVID. And as I always say when we talk about economics, the economic disruptions are not always direct. It's not always the seen. It's usually the unseen that is having a real impact. It, these things are very complex. As a 22-year-old Brit, I'm interested in how you think the British economy is being handled right now by Boris Johnson. And do you think political figures such as Margaret Thatcher would have handled things differently? I do, or at least I hope so. I, no, I think Boris Johnson has been a disaster in every respect. I think shutting down the British economy, shutting down life in the UK uh, has been a disaster. It's awful. Uh, UK has not done better significantly than Sweden, where the economy wasn't shut down, where life wasn't shut down. Um, no, I think all these shutdowns across the world, particularly in these Western countries, have been absolute disasters economically and have not really prevented a lot of deaths because if you look at the death rates, they're very, very high and infection rates are very, very high. So uh, it's not clear what value lockdowns have had. You've locked people up indoors uh, where they're much more susceptible to these diseases than if they're outdoors and moving around and... Um, Yes, I think Thatcher would have handled it differently. And in terms of economics, think about the fact that Boris Johnson has just engaged in a Green New Deal for the UK. Green New Deal. Um, it, 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 you know, uh, I thought conservatives were against Green New Deals. So we're getting a Green New Deal in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the economy can't afford a Green New Deal even in the best of times. It certainly can't afford a Green New Deal in the worst of times, which is what we have right now. So Boris Johnson just turned out to be a disaster, just a disaster. You know, to some extent, one wishes the, the left would have won and then get blamed for all of this, and then the right could have come in afterwards, but it's too late now. Uh, this relates to Ayn Rand. Why did she name herself Ayn Rand? What did it signify? Was she trying to hide her Jewish heritage? She needed a pen name because she knew she would um, she would be writing a lot of anti-communist stuff, and she wanted to try to shield her family from her. I, you know, I don't think it really worked because they could figure out who she was. But so she used a name that didn't didn't implicate her family directly. Uh, she picked the name Ayn. I think uh, both Ayn Rand. Um, I think she picked Ayn, it was a Scandinavian name from stories about Vikings that she read. I can't remember where Rand comes from. It does not come from the typewriter. Um, but I don't think she was trying to hide her Jewish heritage, but she didn't want to emphasize the Jewish heritage either. She did not, it, 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 the Jewish part of the heritage didn't mean much to her. 
Um, I, I think she was looking for an interesting name, a short name, a good literary name, a name that would be remembered, a name, you know, a good marketing name, if you will. And I think I think she got that in Ayn Rand. But I, I don't remember where the name exactly comes from. I know there is some literature about uh, where she got the name from, but I don't, I don't remember it. Uh, is Noam Chomsky a nihilist or is he part of the old left? No, he's not part of the old left. He's a, he's a what he calls a, a leftist anarchist. And, and, and yes, he's, he's, I think he's a nihilist. He's, a, he's a, you know, it's, it's about disintegration. It's about fragmentation. It's about anarchy. Anarchy is destruction. Um, so he's not an old left. Old left were, were all-time socialist types who, who had an integrating principle around the proletarian. And that's not what animates Noam Chomsky. And, and a lot of what animates Chomsky, when you follow him, is hatred of America and hatred of capitalism. It's not even the solutions that he has. But if you, if you listen to his stuff on American foreign policy, he's lying, he's evading, he's deceiving. He's purely motivated by hatred of this country. Why does nihilism give people a thrill? Shouldn't thrills, excitements, and happiness come only from life-enhancing attitudes and activities? Yeah, if you're healthy if you health, have a healthy mind, but if you're unhealthy, if you don't, if you lack self-esteem, if, 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 if uh, you, you lack a focus on your own happiness, a focus on your own life, if you lack all that, then you're not a healthy, productive, positive human being, and therefore you can get a thrill from bad things. Serial killers get a thrill from the murder, from the act. They get sexual arousal from killing people sexually aroused. They're sick people in a sense that their whole value hierarchy, everything about them is distorted and perverted and causes them to feel this way. And I think the same is true of nihilists, not to the extent maybe, but to a very similar extent. Totalitarianism proves it's possible for intellectuals to create an unthinking population who will just follow orders. Maybe Plato was right that most people really aren't much and intellectuals can easily rule. Um, certainly under the right conditions, that's true. But is that, is that the best that we think of the human race? Um, I don't think so. I think today most people can be ruled. I mean, this is one of my observations about the Trump era. What the Trump era showed us is how easily people were willing to be unthinking and how easily people were willing to just go along with anything the guy said, anything the guy said. They're ready for an authoritarian. Trump just wasn't it yet. He's not popular enough. But he could have been it. And, and, and I think you'd have to be more principled than Trump to be the real authoritarian. But I can imagine it happening. I can see it happening. Trump gave us a glimpse of it. And I do think in the culture in which we live, a culture of um, anti-intellectualism, a culture of altruism, a culture of collectivism, we're ripe for exactly that. But you also have the opposite. You also have people following the founders and fighting for freedom. You have people emigrating to America and, 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 and going out into the wilderness and establishing their own communities and their own farms and their own lives and pursuing their own happiness. You have examples of the opposite. So I think it's a matter of culture. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of what kind of culture we have. And culture is ultimately going to be determined by the ideas people hold. And if, I, if people hold bad ideas, they're open to being manipulated. They're open to being mindless. Right? And that's... That's where they are today. The, 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 the ideas that they have are empty. The ideas that they have lead them nowhere. The ideas that they have leave them susceptible to an authoritarian. And I've been warning about this for years and years and years. The alienation, the unprincipled nature of today's intellectuals creates a population that is seeking certainty, that is seeking authority, that is seeking somebody who seems like they know what they're doing. And, and that leads us towards authoritarianism. And of course, that's what led us to authoritarianism in the 20th century. 
But that's culture. People are not original thinkers. Very few people in the world are original thinkers. Very, very few. So, but people can, 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 can think once you give them the tools and once you give them the information and once you give them the ideas, they can integrate knowledge. I mean, I didn't come up with objectivism, but I can integrate it, I can make it mine. And what we need is for them to make their own. And if they do, we can create a culture of independence, a culture of thinkers, a culture that resists authoritarianism. But I gave a little talk the other day on one of the shows, I think Christian turned into a short video of, of why I think it's too early for objectivism, what we would need to happen for a culture to be pro-freedom. And that requires still a lot of work. Why do the vast majority of intellectuals gravitate towards communism and egalitarianism? rather than nationalism and racism? Well, because I think there is a, you know, Ayn Rand said, of all the forms of collectivism, racism is the most primitive. And it is. It's the most primitive and anti-intellectual. It's the most primitive and, 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 and you know, just uh, uh, emotionalist and barbaric of all forms of, of collectivism. And nationalism is, is very similar. Right? It's this arbitrary border that surrounds this place, this makes us special and uniquely different than the people over there. And we should, you know, that's like, if you, if you, if you read Ayn Rand's um, essay on war, The Roots of War, one of her brilliant essays, it's that kind of nationalism, collectivism leads to it. So, Communism and egalitarianism are just as evil, in many respects, more evil. But they are presented as more sophisticated. And they are universal. So they're not, they're not primitive in that sense. It applies to everybody. It doesn't just apply to people of the same color skin or people in the same geographic area. The principles that apply to everybody, they're universal, which is, which is good. Right? Now, these are really, really bad principles, but you want universal principles. So they're more sophisticated. And they're more consistent with a, with, with a view of altruism um, that just views suffering or need as the standard rather than you know, racism, which views need and adds another component. It's an arbitrary component, and even the and egalitarians know that. Although, you know, Marx was, was a racist. Yeah, Marxists don't like to admit it, but if you read his letters with, with um, um, oh, Jesus, the name slipped my mind. But anyway, if you read his letters, you know that he was racist. Harvard Research Studies says one in five people are dying from fossil fuels. You are very critical of laymen being conspiratorial what are they supposed to do when trash is being passed off as science? I agree with you. I don't blame the layman for being conspiratorial. I blame the people who feed the conspiracies. I blame the intellectuals for not providing proper explanations. I blame these idiots who put together these stupid facts, facts and quotes that present, the, you know, a, a pseudoscience that presents itself as science. I generally, even though I rail against people, I generally don't blame common people for much. I, I think they're very much products of the intellectuals. They're very much products of this kind of stuff that they're being fed. So it, it, it is the, it, you know, the conspiratorial nature of the world is, the, the, the conspiracy theories out there are consequences of the fact that It's, somebody says like Alex Jones. It's not even Alex Jones because Alex Jones is not an intellectual. He's just a he's just a feeder of conspiracy theories. No, it's the, the it's it's Paul Krugman. It's um um it's intellectuals on the right who can't explain what's going on, who can't provide real information, who lie to them, who distort, who pervert, and. The com all the common person gets is this 
bombardment of nonsensical stuff that doesn't integrate and none of the intellectuals will integrate it for him. So then comes Alex Jones and he says, no, here's the explanation. Let me put this all together for you. Let me explain the gibberish from the intellectuals. So it's, it's Alex Jones not an intellectual. Alex Jones is just a, a, an opportunist who steps into the void created by the intellectuals who are instead of creating a integrated view of the world, something that we can use to explain what is going on in the world. They fragment and disintegrate and confuse and lie and, and deceive people. And this causes the average person to not know what the hell is going on and create alienation, which I talk about often, how alienated the common person is because of this kind of information that comes to them from Harvard University. Or think about, think about what the intellectuals tell the common man about the minimum wage. And then he can't find a job. Or tell him about, think about what, and so just the intellectuals are political leaders, think about what our political leaders tell him about, we're bringing manufacturing jobs back to America, just wait. So he sits and waits and they never come. And what's he supposed to do? He doesn't understand the intricacies of capitalism and how these jobs are never coming back and they never went away really. They were replaced, he was replaced by a machine and he doesn't even know that. But nobody tells him that what he should really be doing is retraining. And what he should really be doing is moving because they're never coming back to Cincinnati or wherever it happens he live. So the intellectuals and the politicians lie and deceive and, and confuse and disintegrate things for him and then QAnon or or, or Alex Jones come around and say, no, no, there's a simple explanation. The cabal over there does this and that, and they're manipulating, and they're behind. You know, it's the pedophiles. Okay, well, at least I understand that. I understand if somebody's doing it to me. I understand I should hate those people. That's easy. That is understandable. Economics, that's hard. And nobody's giving me an economic explanation. They're giving me anti-economic explanations. So no, I don't blame the common person. I blame the intellectuals and the politicians. I blame people like Ted Cruz, who should know better, who's smart. I blame Paul Krugman. I blame, uh, what's his name, this new guy who just started a think tank, Cass. I blame the people who wrote the essays that the last show I took apart on God, country, and community, right? The new agenda for the right new think tank, new activist organizations, God, country, community. Those are the people I blame. Those are the people who lead people towards either authoritarianism or conspiracy theories. There's no other outlet. Super Bowl just happened. If you root for the underdog, are you being altruistic? Is rooting for the underdog more about going along with your emotions? I don't know. It depends on what your emotions are. I mean, you got to root for somebody. Um, I guess if neither one of the teams is your team, then you've got to root for somebody. Um, it's, it's kind of, there's a certain appeal to rooting for an underdog. As long as you don't despise the better, the better, let's say more successful team because they're better, more successful. So you can root for an underdog, but that doesn't make you hate success for the sake of success. So anybody who rooted for Kansas City but can't see what kind of an achievement Tom Brady had and, and the extent to which he is now clearly the greatest of all time and one of the greatest athletes of all time, doing this at the age of, 40, of, of 43, which is stunning and unthinkable, really, um, in football, a damaging, a physically damaging sport, um, then, you know, how can you, you can't hate Tom Brady. Right? Even if you rooted for the other team, you have to admire him. Otherwise, you're hating the good for being the good. Right? He's good. It's just no question about that. You got to admire that. Would the American price rise in steel production? In steel production, coerce the rest to raise raw prices as well. Would the American price rise in steel production? Coerce the rest to raise... Well, I wouldn't say coerce. But yeah, other manufacturers, and I'm not sure this is what you mean, other manufacturers who use steel are going to raise their prices. And, and we saw this. Uh, tariffs on steel caused prices of steel-based content, steel-based stuff like automobiles. Their price to rise all 
else held constant. Um, so you can't just raise the price of steel through tariffs, not have other implications for it. Would aluminum rise if steel is, if there's a tariff on steel and steel prices rise in the United States, would the price of aluminum also rise? Not necessarily. I'd have to think about that. I don't see why. I mean, it might, if aluminum could be a substitute for steel in certain uses, right? If aluminum could be a substitute for steel in certain uses, then um, demand for aluminum would go up and the demand for aluminum would drive aluminum prices up. Yes. Okay. So yes, the answer is yes. If aluminum is a substitute, right? All right. Um, I think I got all the super chat questions. Okay, great. Thanks guys. Sorry for the technical glitches. It is what it is. Um, but I'm glad, um, the stream was resurrected somewhere else and we still got a stream. Okay, one more question. Is there any point of societal decay that not entering the political fray become moral abdication? I don't understand the question. Because what, what are you abdicating? Let's say I entered the political fray tomorrow. And because, because I observed societal decay around me. What would that do? What would I achieve by that? Who would benefit from that? Nobody. Certainly not me, but nobody. Because if society is decaying, then I cannot have any impact on politics. What, what would it mean for me to run for president? It would mean nobody would vote for me. Let's start, say you started a third party, but nobody will vote for you. What, why? Why do you think politics is primary? The only time not entering politics becomes moral abdication is when society is getting better. But whether it's a third party or going into an existing political party, you would have no influence because nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear the truth. But the way to keep working in principles of persuasion is to work on principles of persuasion for the voters, not for the political party. Right? I'm trying to convince you. And then that will impact how you vote. And then the society is getting better. So if I can convince people in society about these ideas, then the people in society will then elect better politicians. And then it makes sense for me to enter politics. But to enter politics now is a massive, in my view, waste of time, energy, effort, money. When right now we need to be devoting all of our resources, all of our efforts to changing the culture. Politics is downstream from culture, which is downstream for philosophy. But why would anybody listen to me in terms of incremental policy changes? Why would anybody care what I have to say about incremental policy changes? Who am I? What do I have to contribute to the debate in the political realm? Do I bring voters to the table? No, you guys, they're not enough of you. What do I bring that would cause anybody to listen to me? Nothing. Given the corrupt nature of our political system. I don't bring voters. I bring challenges. Good ideas for what? For freedom. But People in politics are not interested in good ideas. Who's interested in good ideas? Biden? Trump? Ted Cruz? Marco Rubio? Who's interested in good ideas? Who in politics is interested in good ideas? People want leadership to propose free market legislation. Can I call bullshit on that? Who are, the pe who are these people who want... Free market legislation. I don't know. I don't know who they are. And who would give me the power to propose free market legislation? And by the way, there are a ton of groups involved in politics. I mean, look at, look at Cato Institute. Cato Institute writes, I don't know, I get tons of working papers from there. 
about changing this legislation and working that legislation and moving more towards free markets here and working more towards free markets there. They do massive amounts of work in the realm of proposing legislation to work to move us towards more free markets. Has anybody listened to them in the last 40 years? No, or barely. Where have they gotten? All they do is politics. So I'm not saying I've gotten any better, that I've done any better, but I know that that path is not a productive path to go by. That's, let Cato do it. They do a fine job. You know, the guy I read, whose articles I read from you today, Scott Lidicum, he does that. And he's great at it. Okay. I mean, luckily, we had some education, regulation from 40 years ago. We haven't had a deregulation bill in Congress since the 1980s, I don't think. Maybe some in the 90s. And if you get a little bit of regulation reform, so what? You, you're willing to dedicate your life for that? Not me. I'm much more ambitious than that. I want to change your minds. I want to I put you on a path towards success and happiness and towards being advocates for, 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 for real laissez-faire capitalism. I don't want to just change a little regulation here and there. And, and if you consider what Trump did, everything Trump did is going to be reversed by Biden like that, which is exactly what I said when he did it. It's not that valuable. So, I don't know. I, I, I just don't understand what the point is in going to politics. Yeah, I'd rather see more objectivist screenwriters, more objectivist artists, more objectivist novelists, more objectivist professors, more objectivist masters, more objectivist YouTube more objective psychologists and politicians. We'll get to politics when the world is ready. Battle Beaver says, I was first made aware of Ayn Rand when I was 21. I'm 54 now. To say reading Atlas Shrugged changed my thinking profoundly would be an understatement. Know exactly how you feel. Now, for my question. What's your favorite sci-fi movie? Ooh, movie. That's a tough one. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's between Aliens, the second Alien, uh, or Terminator 2. So both James Cameron movies from the 1980s. Now, Blade Runner is way too dark, way too pessimistic. It's very well made, but way too pessimistic. Um, 2001 is just, it's just unintelligible. And, and at the end of the day, not that interesting. Logan's run is good, but I think Terminator 2, I think Aliens, the second Alien movie, far superior movies. They're, they're some of the best action movies ever made. They're, they're great science fiction. They're exciting and they have really, really, both of those movies have really, really, really good uh, philosophical themes. Aliens, it's, it's, it's all about the human mind. It's, it's Sigourney Weaver's reason and rationality. Starship Trooper is way too now. I mean, the book was, was good. It wasn't one of the headlines best, and the movie was not that good. Um, no, Terminator 2, is, the theme is, is free will, and it's beautifully concretized, powerfully made and incredibly suspenseful. Star Trek for indeed had whales. You know, big environmentalist movie. Um, but uh, no, I'd say, yeah, those two are the ones I can think of right now. There might be some old ones. I'm not a huge fan of the Star Wars franchise. I'm not a, I like Star Trek, but I like the TV series, the original one best. Star Trek was good, but it, you know, can't compare to Terminator. Sorry. Terminator 1 and 2 are phenomenal. And uh, Aliens 2 is phenomenal. Of course, Alien 1 was the uh, same director as Blade Runner, Ridley Scott. All right. Thanks, guys. I will see you all tomorrow, I hope. If, I hope I'll be able to squeeze in a show tomorrow morning. Uh, it'll be fairly early, I think. Uh, and 
yeah, look forward to look forward to that. I did a, a talk. If you missed it, I did a talk earlier today. The video sucks, but I think the content is pretty good. You can find that on my channel uh, just a little bit while ago, like an hour or two ago. I did a talk for a Russian audience, Russian objectivists uh, interested in objectivism. Um, don't forget to like the show before you leave. Don't forget to support the Iran Book Show at iranbookshow.com slash support. Patreon or subscribe star. Monthly contributions are greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. And um, thanks for all the super chatters today. Bye, everybody. I will... Um,